Let me go ahead and get going. I threw this together, so I'm not a uh, I'm not a uh, designer by any 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 standard, but we can. Uh, I think it looks alright. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, basically, uh, I kind of want to just give my spiel about um, you know the practical realities of the industry at large, uh, the stuff that you'll be seeing in software engineering, the um, the ideas of. Uh, systems that evolve over time and uh, hopefully give you kind of the realistic perspective of the kind of work that you'll be doing if you end up going into the software engineering field. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, my current roles include uh, I manage a team of software developers for Cigna if you've uh, ever heard and they're a, so they're a uh, insurance company um, and so I have a team of developers under me who build uh, things like data visualizations, APIs for uh, for data. Um, as well as that, I also teach for the UCF Coding Bootcamp here in Orlando, Florida, uh, and we teach the uh, MERN stack through a full a full stack JavaScript curriculum. And as well as that, I I do a couple of uh, classes for the community college here in Orlando, Valencia College, and those. Uh, those include um, intro to client side and intro to server side development. And as well, I am a peer of yours. Uh, I will be graduating hopefully here in fall 2021. Um, so just a bit about my background. Uh, and so essentially, uh, I really wanted to touch on these uh, these main topics of discussion. So the, the broadness and scope of software engineering in the field itself uh, and kind of the stuff that you'll be working on when you become a software engineer and how that relates to uh, software evolution. So this is a simple little circle thing that I built about my my department. And so here's my team down here. That's the, uh, the web applications team. And those are the people that I manage. They build their, they build their, uh, their visualizations. Uh, we work on an API. Um, so we got web developers and we have server-side developers. Um, and so just in my department, we also work with teams of database developers. And the only thing that they work on from a day-to-day -day perspective is managing our SQL Server uh, setup to get, develop, to get data from different parts of the company, uh, aggregate that for us, make it organized in a, in a way that's easy to feed into our web applications. We also work with BI developers who work with uh, Tableau, um, they're hands-on experts of kind of the the data of the company, so they can dig up uh, perspectives on contact center stuff, um, prescriptions, insurance benefits, and all that stuff, and uh, assist with other team members. As well as we have a data science department in our team, so they uh, they do a lot of uh, forecasting and modeling for uh, projection projections for the for the business. So they can say, hey. Um, we predict based on this historical data through whatever machine learning model we built that uh, our, our call volume will be at this level so we should balance our, our staffing to, uh, to be at this level so that we're not uh, spending more money than we need to or we're not spending enough money so that the, that the call times aren't long and such. So that's just my small department and that's uh, in a company of thousands of developers. So as a, as a larger scope, here's that whole department in the bottom right corner, the, uh, the analytics. And so um, in a larger enterprise environment, you might have teams and, and groups specialized for certain purposes. So these are just some of the different ones that, I interact, uh, that I've interacted with on a, uh, on a personal perspective. Um, so I used to be on the specialty pharmacy developers team where I actually built user interfaces for them and I manage a team over there, uh, as well as other departments that specialize in kind of the different areas of business like home delivery pharmacy. Um, but then there's also groups that, uh, oh, I didn't uh, change my titles here. Uh, the top left title should have been infrastructure. So groups that handle solely infrastructure. So you'll have software engineers who are working on the mainframe, which has the, the business rules the the um, the actual uh, processing of a of a pharmacy script, uh, very old business logic, legacy systems. You'll have data architects that kind of manage the different layers of uh, of information that are passed from system to system. 
So they're you know at the guts of what our our data actually is as a company, uh, and that, so that's not you know inclusive of the different data stuff that my department works on. Uh, this actually gets into the the raw data that's collected day in and day out. And as well as you'll have teams that are managing um, public cloud efforts, AWS, um, Azure, um, private cloud. So so uh, servers that our depart that our uh, company manages on in our own data centers, but we we treat it like its own cloud systems. Um, and support groups, things like UX departments, so places where uh, software systems are designed um, and help support different groups. Uh, system security, so a group the, of pen testers um, and, soft and security engineers who kind of look at the different applications that other groups are making and make standards for uh, protecting patient information. Uh, and again, these are, these are just a subset of what I, I know in my head. Um, you know, Cigna is, is, uh, is made up of, like I said, thousands of software developers of all different shapes and backgrounds. And so the bottom line of all that is to, to show that the discipline of software engineering, very big. Um, you will never know all pieces of it. Uh, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm a full stack developer that has mostly specialized in the front end of web applications. Uh, and I can touch databases and do a little bit with them, but by no means am I a master of it. I, I'm certainly not super awesome at, at putting servers together and installing, installing the necessary software to run cron jobs or any kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, the, the field is your oyster. You can, you can pick and choose any sort of niche you want to be in. You don't want to work on visualizations or things that customers see. You can churn data all day. You can be a database administrator that never sees the light of day of, uh, no, I'm just kidding, but uh, you can just work on numbers and things like that. You can be your a cool web dev who, who builds nothing but websites um, and all kinds of stuff. And so that brings us to like the topic at large, like the, the professor is saying in terms of software as evolution. And so what will you actually be working on when you go and get hired at a, at a software company? Um, most likely, the answer to that is not new software. So you actually are, you kind of have a, a, a little bit of a skew with um, how we've uh, started with um, you know, our projects. We build something from scratch uh, and we, we pick out different pieces of, of libraries and it's like a, it's like a fun little shopping trip. Um, when you get hired somewhere, that's most likely not going to be the case. So this talks about uh, software evolution and essentially, um, companies have built software systems and they are currently maintaining them. Um, and so when you get hired somewhere, you are likely to be maintaining and changing those systems over time. And that's what falls under this topic of software evolution, basically how a system is going to be changed over time, how it's maintained, how it's supported. Come here, bud. And uh, so I pulled this piece from the textbook uh, and the, the bold piece is that 60 between 60 and 90 percent of software costs are evolution costs meaning that you're not spending the majority of your money building new systems building new uh new um uh you know market deployable things this is these are all changes uh maintenance or uh adding features to software that are already there and so 75 percent of development staff uh, were involved in software evolution meaning that when you get hired somewhere you will be handed a code base and say okay you will need to learn this code base so you can make changes to it um, be effective in developing in it and so on and so forth um, and so what does that mean like i said uh, you will be most likely working on software systems that were there before you were hired and will be there after you leave uh, and so, so the next person's hired and so on and so forth uh, because these systems last years and years and so you don't often get a chance to start software from scratch. You will at some point. I doubt. I don't doubt that. I have. Uh, I have personally been able to start a whole project from scratch, from beginning to end. But even new projects, you know, it's unlikely that you will be there at the pinnacle of when they decide, hey, we're starting this new application, and you're going to be on the ground floor of it. You might be hired a few months into it when they decide that they need to uh, add staff to help build it. Uh, and so oftentimes you'll be asked to make changes to, to code bases that you're unfamiliar with. And so 
you'll be asked to read different pieces of code um, and figure it out, figure out what it's doing so that you can be an effective software developer. And you know that all falls under this idea of software evolution. Uh, so that kind of touches on this idea of a, of a system of systems. Um, so Cigna is a large enterprise environment. It's one that I have uh, worked in for four years. And so when you become that big, there are uh, there is a consideration for uh, for how certain changes can impact other things. Now, not all changes will impact another system, but if we kind of take a look back at uh, you know, the graph here, uh, if the cloud DevOps team decides to uh, push a change to the uh, the the underlying infrastructure. Um, it's certainly a chance that that kind of stuff will trickle down to the other departments. Um, and so if we're, you know, my part department, for instance, if we're running on some sort of architecture that, uh, that has been changed, um, th that could be a breaking change that might affect it. So that's why when we learned about the whole process of change management, it, uh, you know, release, the idea of release changes is, is super important once you get to a large scale. And they have whole cycles around that because of this problem of changes that change, uh, you know, other systems down the line. Uh, and so, what can be kind of done about that? Um, the trend basically is that software is moving towards microarchitectures or small, tiny sets of systems that are loosely coupled, meaning that they don't rely on each other. They communicate with each other, but don't necessarily. Uh, if you swap one out, the other systems won't necessarily care about that versus monoliths. And the idea of a monolith is a giant system that does, uh, that does everything. Um, and so that touches on this idea of legacy systems. And so legacy systems are this idea of big giant systems that have been around a long time. Uh, they're usually large and do a lot of jobs. They're at the heart of the company because that was the trend of software development back in the 50s and 60s. Oh, software is cool. Let's build a, a big system that will do everything for us and we can automate a lot of stuff. And it turns out um, that works for the short term, but over time your needs change. Your uh, And so as, uh, as time goes on, these systems um, are kind of unwieldy. Since they do everything, when you change something, it usually affects everything. And that means that uh, you have to be very careful about changing those systems. They're hard to maintain. Um, and as time goes on, uh, it, they say that uh, that code ages like a fine milk because it eventually becomes disgusting. Uh, and so your knowledge of the system in the company is going to dwindle uh, become, or become siloed, especially, you know, that's the, the trend of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, they didn't have these kind of big overlying processes to make sure things were documented and that uh, you had maintenance plans put into place. You just built the system and we're like, okay, this is going to be our system and we're going to work with it. And eventually over time, it becomes harder to actually get people who have the skill sets to maintain those systems. Um, and so what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, there are programming languages running most of the large companies and banks and such that you're not going to find developers for anymore. If anyone uh, read any articles about um, New York hiring COBOL developers for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I don't know a single line of COBOL. They don't teach that in universities anymore, uh, and especially here at UF. I haven't taken a COBOL class, and nobody wants to program in COBOL. That's what these uh, old mainframe developers are working on. Um, and those systems are often at the, the heart and core of the business that are, that are running business processes. Um, and so, uh, legacy systems, very, uh, very much a pain. Uh, and so what do we, what do we end up doing about legacy systems? Our best. <laughs> That's the honest answer. Um, uh, I've certainly interacted with my fair share of legacy systems. Uh, the problem is that, you know, they are doing a job and if we pay someone to try to replace it, well, that's effort that's going to take a while. You're not going to see gains over, over, over time um, until they're finally done. Um, and even those gains might, you know, lowering maintenance costs and, um, and 
making developers lives easier is not a very sexy proposition to to uh, uh, a corporate board of directors they want to see you know new features being pushed out and uh, and uh, you know cool new architecture being built um, but the problem is they all lie on top of old legacy systems so what are our options for that um, sometimes you can kind of refactor these over time that is a possibility so there there's a lot of old code that can kind of uh, uh, be looked at and learned about uh, oftentimes strategies involve kind of taking a job that that legacy system is doing like one small piece and building a smaller system around that that can replace the portion of that job so you're kind of slowly chunking away at a legacy system and taking the the core pieces that are have really been painful for the business and starting to rework them um, and sometimes eventually they will be retired uh, because the the costs of maintaining it the uh, the pain of of uh, developing on them and the slow really what really causes it to uh, to uh, eventually go away is that when when uh, speed to market becomes so slow due to being held back by legacy systems that uh, that companies finally kind of see the wool pulled from their eyes and they'll do something to, to work to replace those systems but that usually takes a very long long time and uh, I've been at a uh, Express Scripts four years and I've seen efforts that started when I worked there that haven't completed yet in terms of replacing old legacy architecture. And it's usually a very uh, iterative process. It's one that uh, kind of just goes uh, goes on forever. Uh, and things usually get better over time, but uh, they don't, um, you know, there's not like a, you flip a switch one day and you can turn off the old legacy system. It's, it's kind of a slow dying death of it. Um, and that's really it. Uh, in terms of in terms of what I got, uh, so those are some of the perspectives I have from my time in the field, um, and uh, made this little chess slide here at the end. So, anyone have any any questions or concerns? Oh, I do. Yeah. Uh, you talk about legacy code and the challenges it presents. I'm kind of wondering at what point does software become legacy? Because it seems like every single piece of code becomes <laughs> legacy at some point. That's a great question. So um, mostly stuff become stuff doesn't become legacy probably now as as easily as it used to, uh, because we've we've learned from the old legacy systems that we've had. So while yes, um, even a, a web application that I built five years ago that I haven't touched in five years is really legacy software at this point because just of the speed of the field. If, uh, if a system is built with a maintenance plan in mind to take uh, dependencies and architecture of this thing and, uh, and build it in a way that, hey, when, when the new version of this library comes out, let's, we're going to have a plan, a plan to upgrade, um, and you've put time and effort into thinking about how uh, a system is going to evolve over time and what kind of changes you're going to need, uh, it tends to become legacy slower, uh, much slower. Um, I would say that there is no, there is no system that doesn't eventually become legacy. Uh, it's gonna just kind of depend on the upfront effort that you put into determining uh, how you're going to maintain that system, and so uh, you'll find that it doesn't become such a pain now as it as it was back in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, especially because in development nowadays we have a lot of cool tools like cloud architecture where we're not actually installing these systems by hand you're deploying them to aws or azure at the click of a button and if you need to change the underlying software well that's just you know a couple of drop downs and hit submit um, versus uh, procuring a, a server for the specifications of the hardware you did in in the 80s and uh, installing the system on it and then an update for that is going to you know be a pain right um, so it's a uh, I would say, um, you know, at a hard line, if you don't maintain a system, it it's probably a legacy within four to five years. If you are actively maintaining it, it won't become legacy so quickly. Right. So it seems like legacy is something that when you start a project, it's something that you can think about, design for, and consider. Like these containers having guidelines on how to maintain things and documentation. A hundred percent. And honestly, um, you know, 
certain things could happen that will make a system become legacy faster. Um, for instance, in the in the field of web applications, uh, in the in the early uh, 2010s or so, you you started having the advent of single page applications that uh, come here, bud. Single page applications on on libraries that uh, were built for that purpose, and then along came React uh, and this idea of a component architecture, and now all web applications are built with this idea of components. And so anything, any single page application not built to that standard instantly becomes legacy because uh, that's you know not where the, the trend of software is anymore for web applications. Your front ends are now built with uh, component-based libraries and not as a whole monolithic system. So there are things that could just happen that will make your system legacy and you have to maybe do a rewrite or something or just kind of maintain it. and that. You know that's something you can't really control for necessarily, uh, but you can take action to control for other factors. Mm, okay, thanks. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, when you had the slide of where there was the circles for different groups, yeah, how much interaction, like, is there between people in the different groups? Is that a daily thing or? Uh, good question. Um, for the most, I mean, it's going to depend from, from company to company. For the most part, it's not a ton. Um, I can communicate with them anytime I want, but it's unless I have a need to, I, I don't necessarily have to. Um, so, I mean, uh, for instance, I never talk to the, the, the other application developers, mostly because my operation analytics doesn't really cross paths with them. But every year, I talk to system security because they'll want to do pen penetration tests of our applications. Or we'll talk to the hey. UX department when we're going to build a new dashboard. Or we'll, uh, we'll interact with the, uh, the cloud DevOps teams when we need to um, procure certain uh, infrastructure for a new application and, and spin up different uh, server instances. So you know that's going to be a, a company-dependent sort of interaction. In terms of my department, though, I interact with almost all these people on a on a daily basis. So you know, as you get smaller and smaller and more close to your level, you know, you'll interact with people more often. I'm talking to the database developers daily. I'm talking to the data scientists weekly. Um, the BI developers every so often. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? You don't have to answer this, but I'm kind of curious why you you came to UF to get a degree. Like you already seem to have a pretty great job. <laughs> That's a great question. So funny <laughs> enough, uh, yeah, I know, really funny, right, bud? Uh, so funny enough, I uh, uh, I'm actually a UF dropout. Uh, so I actually attended UF in the uh, from the years 2010 through 2012 to kind of give you an, uh, a guess at my age. Uh, and I was trying to become a doctor back in the day, um, and I, uh, I I partied a little too hard. That was back when when Gainesville. Uh, I mean, Gainesville's still a wild place, but <clears throat> I don't know if you if uh, you can get twenty five cent beverages in in Gainesville anymore. Uh, maybe you can. It's been a long time, but uh, so I uh, you know I kind of fell through the uh, the gaps a bit, and I uh, I eventually did a a coding boot camp to try to get into the field, which is actually why I like to teach them, and I have a pretty big passion for education. Come here, bud. Um, and I always kind of wanted to go back and get that UF degree, so I uh, I did end up starting going back to school when when I started working for my current company because they offer tuition reimbursement, and I figure you know the money is on the table, why not? Um, and so I, uh, that's uh, that's kind of why I wanted to go back. Um, and eventually, I, I have an intention to to do some like uh, graduate programs. I have a, I have an inkling that I want to do stuff with AI. Um, so yeah, that's why I went back. That's a good question though. I do have a second question. Um, so you say that you work on the web application section in like in our project that we all work on. Well, most of us are making websites, and I noticed how heavily dependent we are on databases. 
So I'm kind of wondering, because looking at your organization chart, it looks like databases is managed by somebody else. And uh, so how does like that work? Like trying to navigate who's responsible for what? Because it seems like sometimes you would need to like reach into the database pretty deeply and mess around with that. Yeah. You can't just silo it and hand the responsibility to somebody else. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and you know, that's also gonna be a very, a very company dependent thing. Stuff grows to the size of enterprise level um, when the sheer scale of of software just kind of forces you to eventually you can't have teams that know everything about the software so you end up having sure. specialized uh specialized folks working on subsections of different systems um, <laughs> whereas if you're if you're working for you know a hip startup uh where you're actually building the initial product that's going to make you a multi-billion dollar company uh, you're, you're not going to need all those resources because you're just trying to get something spun up off the ground uh, and the concerns for uh, you know a team of data scientists or a team that manages just the, the, the database isn't going to be as high um, and so how it ends up working is uh, you're, you're not wrong it's, it's, it's definitely difficult having kind of a separation and silos can definitely form if you're not careful and so really you just have to kind of focus on constant communication between different teams uh, uh, making sure that uh, you have the right stakeholders and partners engaged uh, for multi-team efforts and that really gets into the process of stuff we've talked about before where we uh, you know we're if we're going to do a quarterly planning for the the number of sprints we're going to do for the quarter um, we have to make sure that work that we need from other teams, like a database team, uh, is on their roadmap so that it aligns to our roadmap. And so, so much of software development is just a big, huge, tedious process. <laughs> uh, not that the developers will often interact with that on a day-to-day -day basis, but as someone who manages them, I, I tend to have to. Um, so, you know, that's some, one of the cons, but life. And it actually speaks to the diversity of software um, engineering because um, there's a lot of misconception that people think software engineering equals software programmer. That that's all you do is just code and program. So um, what you just mentioned, Michael, was good insight. Did I answer your question or? Uh... Oh yeah, yeah, it does. Um, are there any other questions? I mean, I got a dirt one, but I think I asked a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, man. Okay. Um, you said that most of the time, I mean, like basically like 90% of the time, software developers are working on existing code bases. And I know that in university, you pretty much always make it software. You never actually have given a project and like, okay, figure out how to deploy it or something like that. Uh, do you have any tips on how to navigate very complicated large code bases? Oh, great question. Um, it'll always be difficult. Uh, in terms of in terms of tips for it, um, for the most part, uh, it it will be kind of along the lines of tips that you would I give for someone trying to learn a new library, which is often <laughs> reading existing documentation, uh, and so. Um, most most time most of the times nowadays people will actually document their their system and so you'll be given kind of a high level readout of of what certain pieces do that's not always the case again it's going to be dependent on who wrote it and uh how much care they put into it but uh documentation at a high level helps um looking at kind of uh depending on the system system diagrams or architectural diagrams helps kind of visualize what the pieces are uh, but oftentimes at the end of the day, you kind of have to play around with the system. So for instance, if you're work working on like a, on a, a SQL Server database, you just have to do a bunch of SQL queries and start looking into what's in the table. <laughs> you have to look at uh, where certain pieces of information are. Or if you're, if you're working on uh, a web application, you just have to start digging through the code and, uh, and reading it. And most of the time, you're not going to just be alone you'll have people there to help and i definitely encourage anyone who gets into the field to to lean on people uh members of the team who have been there a while 
Um, they're definitely, you know, it's a very welcome field. They're not going to just kind of say, you know, go work on this software. They're they're going to walk you through it, probably give you a, a gentler introduction than uh, than you might expect when you first hop on the job. Um, and uh, yeah, the only real way though to get comfortable with it, I, I'd say, is to just get in the guts of the code and start trying to trying to read it and piece it together. Um, but it's not easy. It's never easy. Uh, and so even most most there 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 are a lot of people that say you know I don't expect a software developer to become productive in our environment until you know they've been here for a few months because that's just the reality of it. Uh, it's hard for anyone to pick up something an unfamiliar code base and immediately start being productive and worth it. So um, that's a good lead in. One of my questions, Michael, I have for you. Can you talk a little bit about the soft skills and working in a team environment and in industry? Um, what what it what it takes or you know, your contribution to make make your team successful? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I definitely think um, in terms of soft skills, uh, having having good communicators is always is always a plus. Um, you won't always have a team of good communicators, but certainly something I look for as a as a manager that you don't have the 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 personality of a dry sponge. Um, because in the end, you know, I'm gonna have to work with you every day, and you want to be someone that I that I can that I can carry on a technical conversation with and not kind of get one word answers from. Um, so communication is is key, uh, making sure that uh, and you know that's where really a lot of the um, the agile processes that we learn about in the class really really end up facilitating. You're often communicating all the time on a daily basis. You're seeing what everyone's working on. You're making sure every week to kind of reflect on what you've done and try to improve it. Um, you're planning a lot uh, and. All that communication and in even the documentation of that communication keeps everyone on the ball. So communicating is very high up there. Um, in terms of other soft skills, I'd say that uh, um, eagerness and a willing to learn is going to take you a lot further than just uh, pure technical knowledge. So being able to adapt to kind of shifting changes, you know, like I talked about where the where web applications shifted. Um, you also have to shift. You have to uh, shift with the industry, or you'll be a Flash developer who lost their job because Apple killed Flash, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, being being flexible, being able to to adapt and learn, is uh, is key in the uh, in the field. Um, and yeah, those are those are the big ones I'd say in terms of soft skills. Yeah, you led into my second question, which was I wanted you to talk about um, how tech is moving so fast that you have to be an independent learner. Otherwise, you will get outdated really quickly. Can you talk about your experience with that? Yeah, definitely. So actually, when I um, when I did my coding boot camp in 2015, I'd say that 90 percent of what I, I learned there is obsolete at this point. Um, that was at the year where where JavaScript actually became a uh, a crazy uh, crazy good language with the advent of of ES twenty fifteen, um, and as well as the uh, the shift of old single page applications from a monolithic architecture to a component based architecture, and really uh, you just kind of have to have to <laughs> suck it up and 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 deal with it or relegate yourself to the fact that you will uh, that you will you will be able to work on legacy systems but but you will be kind of left behind by the industry as, at large and so I've seen a lot of people who I've taught um, who were developers in the 90s and early 2000s that they just got so far behind that they didn't even know where to start in terms of how web applications and server-side programming is done at this at this juncture in time um, and so there's often there's often a, a bit of keeping your ear to the uh, to the industry and kind of learning what's out there. Um, it's easy to get caught up in whatever company you're working at and really kind of stay stale on your skills. But uh, you know things are always changing, and if uh, if your growth kind of reaches a plateau at wherever you're at, it's often 
a, a sign that you might want to consider making a change um, because the most skills you're going to get at is in your work and if your work isn't um, helping you grow then uh, you're um, then you might want to make a shift to somewhere where it, you will actually grow uh, that being said I I, you do not have to go out. Uh, it is it is tough, and it is kind of a. Some people panic. I used to panic a lot about having to learn new stuff all the time because it just felt like there's constantly new things. You do not always have to go out and grab the the latest flashy tool. Um, problem solving skills are always going to be more important than than the latest library of the day, um, and even even certain you know not flashy libraries are still great problem solvers uh, so while stuff is changing super rapidly um, your uh, your attitude and adaptability to it is is probably more important than actually going out and uh, being able to pick it up on the fly so okay awesome so i do have a question hold on, for a hold on for a second i wanted to ask this third one which i'm going to include the one in the chat i don't know if you're going but um so in terms of independent learning and, and knowledge gathering we had a question in the chat of what's a good good, good boot camp but i want to <laughs> extend that and say you know what other what other platforms that people go to i know my tas a lot talk about Hey, students need to learn how to Google stuff. <laughs> There's an art in Googling. So what's um, one, what's a good boot camp for um, Miguel in the chat? And then two, what's strategies or platforms or ways to go about learning new technology? That's an excellent question. Um, one that I really like because it's definitely, um, it's definitely hard out there. And so I probably wouldn't, you know, take it from me, boot camps are expensive. Uh, you don't necessarily want to want to do something that uh, that costs a lot of money, um, and so usually uh, the approach that I take is that if I have to learn, if I have some idea of kind of some technology I want to use or or uh, or thing that I think will be beneficial to the company, I like to turn to Udemy, um, and so I. Don't necessarily use all my courses on Udemy, but I uh, I do have a or finish them. I I do kind of peek through them for reference, uh, and so there are a lot of online learning platforms that are pretty cheap. You mo you can uh, you can uh, you know I like Udemy because you can get a course that will last your lifetime and not have to uh, pay like a subscription fee. So if you and usually you know a good course will uh, a good course will will uh, be continuously updated and you can kind of judge that based on the ratings of the course uh, so that's my personal recommendation otherwise though there's some tons of just free stuff out there for uh, for um, you know blog posts and people just uh, building stuff that if you if you read it and work through the code that they give you in 15 20 minutes you're likely to learn quite a bit um, and you can spin up some pretty cool stuff within the course of an hour that do that do neat things uh, And so really I just kind of recommend probably um, You know if I need like a if I need like a, a larger thing like advanced C programming um, You know I, I'm or a big topic or a big library that I want to be able to dig into every aspect of it I will probably get some sort of course for it, uh, and it'll cost me probably ten dollars when it goes on sale, or twelve bucks. Um, and you know, I'm willing to invest that in my learning. Uh, but there's a lot of free resources out there. I think UF does free LinkedIn Learning, um, so you can you can do that. Uh, I, I see that Juan mentioned um, Harvard's CS50 courses, which are good for a lot of problem-solving fundamentals. Um, so it's difficult to say, you know, what. You know, where you should go. I have my preference. A lot of people will give you their, their own preferences. I think uh, um, as long as you're just willing to go out and find resources. So if you're if you're I want to learn the Mern stack, well find find some uh, you know, find a ten dollar Mern stack course and and try to code along with it and build stuff. Um, or if you need to pick up the, the nuances of advanced C programming, which I've barely gone into, then do that uh or linear algebra which was taught with hard <laughs> so awesome um when we have one more question um demi would you like to ask your question 
Um, yeah. Um, so as someone who prefers like the management side of software, is it possible to go straight into like product or project management? Or do you believe that becoming a software engineer first is like more beneficial long-term to becoming like a better like manager? Ooh, that's a controversial question. I like it. Um, so, uh, I like that one a lot. So definitely my path, um, was as a developer first. And so I worked on, I worked on uh, front end, front end development for web applications and then became a manager of front end developers, which for sure, um, lends a, lends a, lends a bit of credibility to me as a manager because I, you know, I was one of them. Um, that being said, I don't believe that you have to necessarily do that. Uh, and there, you know, when, even when you just say manager, that's a broad term that in itself has a lot of things. Like you said, there's project managers who, uh, who are really um, focused on organizing uh, projects and uh, working with the business stakeholders to, uh, to get things aligned versus myself, who's more of a, p a person manager who uh, who actually manages the developers themselves and mentors them and uh, I, I don't often code all the time but I'm I'm able to kind of give my suggestions on architecture and things like that uh, and you know so th it's definitely wide out there I would say if that's kind of what you're looking to do out the gate and you know that's kind of what you're looking to do there are a lot of um, there are a lot of good kind of project management um, certifications out there uh, and even you know some people kind of I, I have a, a certified scrum master certification and it, I think it's been one of the most valuable things I've uh, I've done and um, there are a lot of agile certifications out there that uh, that companies are hungry for and they're they'll always have them in their postings and stuff and while that might not necessarily uh, you might not think that lends itself to being a manager um, just being able to understand the process of all kinds of stuff is uh, is helpful, uh, and has helped me in my management. Um, so, there, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff out there for project management and specifically like certifications and stuff. Um, I think you should have, you should try to get some amount of technical knowledge. That doesn't mean you have to be a developer before you uh, manage stuff, but you should. Uh, be able to kind of read and hold a technical conversation. But if you haven't, you know, built a full functioning um, application, I, I don't think that that is held against you as long as you sound competent. That makes awesome. sense. Awesome, thank you, thank you. That was great, Michael. Um, yeah, it, it was great because we just talked about certifications last week. <laughs> so that was awesome. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, your your baby is adorable, and I know people enjoyed your baby just as much as we enjoyed you. So I really appreciate this, um, and I know the students uh, appreciate it as well. You can hang out if you want. I'm just going to solicit questions about Sprint 2 presentation. So it's totally up to you, but uh, thanks so much, Mike. Sure, absolutely. I'll stop sharing. Okay, so for the last couple minutes, yeah, I want to take your questions. I know some people were asking the TAs about Sprint 2 presentation. And um, if you had not had a chance, if you weren't in the lecture on Friday and you have not had a chance to view the lecture on Friday, I posted the slides and the recordings. I highly recommend that you go look at that first before you reach out to the TAs because the TAs are getting uh, repetitive questions that are answered um, in the lecture and the slides. So take a look at that. And then if you have some additional questions, yes, by all means, come to the TAs, come to me. But I wanted to open up to see um, if I can answer anything or provide clarification about Sprint 2 presentation. Uh, you mentioned that it could be possible to get bonus points. Oh, right. I'm sorry? Uh, you mentioned it was possible to get bonus points for the Sprint 2. Uh, well, what are you looking for when you like assign those kind of things, or oh, if it's true? 
Oh, yes. So I mentioned that's what happened um, in Sprint 1 presentation. There were some teams that just went way above and beyond that I assessed that that deserves some bonus points. So it's kind of like a case by case basis. Um, there's not a rubric for bonus points. Um, and the bonus points are like a couple of points. Um, but yes, definitely, if you go way above and beyond the requirements, that warrants some type of bonus, then uh, that is a possibility. Okay, any other questions? Um, now's the chance to ask them from me because normally the TAs will direct the questions back to me. And so um, I'm here. If you guys have any questions, um, I can definitely answer them. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the slide for the Sprint 2 presentation from last week, I didn't see any anything mentioned about wireframe or use cases. Uh, do we include it in the presentation? Do we not? Is, is it okay if we do? So when I spoke about use cases, uh, so yes, the wireframes, the system models, I think I labeled it as system models. So if you did not discuss wireframes from your Sprint 1 presentation or the system context model from your Sprint 1, you definitely want to bring it up for Sprint 2. And then yes, everyone is required to go over the use case model in their presentation. And so we had an extensive conversation about the due date of the use case model. It, initially, I had it set for Monday, but we talked about that you all are supposed to put it in your presentation. And I know people are presenting all the way up until Friday. So I changed the date to Friday, but you are still responsible to go over the use case in your presentation. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so it's 3.50, um, I can hang out a couple more minutes. Like I said, there is a class after me, but um, I can jump on um, my office hours Zoom if need be, um, but I will hang out for a couple more minutes. Other than that, have a great day, everyone.